Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hoki mai e te iwi. For those who don't know me, my name is Rose Haskell, aka Plunkett Rose, and I am joining you from the not-so-sunny Taranaki region. Today kicks off the first of three chats that we will be holding this week live on Facebook through our page Bano Afina Plunkett. Our topic for today is what is eczema? I am joined by Lydia Snell. Now, Lydia is a pediatric clinical nurse, and she joins us from the sunny Bay of Plenty. Kia ora, Lydia. How are you today? Kia ora, Rose. Yes, I'm doing well. It is not a very nice day here. Blustery and wet, and it feels like snow is around, although we don't get snow here. <laughs> yes. Same with, same with Taranaki. I think it's going to snow on our maunga. Um, thank you so much, Lydia, for joining us today. Uh, before we get into our topic, what is eczema, I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to us. So who are you? How long have you been doing your mahi for? Say that again, Rose, sorry. I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. So tell us a little bit about who you are and how long you've been doing your work for. So I've been working in this role for around about 13 years now and it's a community role that bridges with uh, secondary care. So I'm based at Whakatane Hospital and visit in community of Portiki down to Kaha um, in, in the area of the Eastern Bay of Plenty, visiting families for a number of reasons, one of which is managing eczema. So um, over that time, I've learned really what eczema looks like and therefore how to manage it, because it is a huge burden of disease on our, on our whanau. Um, you know, 25% of children, up to 25% of children sometime in their life suffer from eczema. So I really have developed a passion and treating eczema well to, to reduce the burden of the disease on whānau and children and, you know, schools and that sort of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. So on that, on that note, so that's, that's exactly right. So many, so many children have eczema um, these days and there's always, there's always been that. Is problem the best word for it? But it is very prevalent uh, in our tamariki. Yes. So can we um, can we bring it back and if you can give us a little overview of what what exactly is eczema um, in the in the diagnostic context? How do how do we get to the point of knowing um, that eczema is eczema as a as a um, diagnosis? So when I talk to Fano and they've got a baby that's referred to me with a rash. We talk about eczema in a baby that's say six weeks to three months, and we talk about it's an itchy, dry skin that is inflamed. So, you know, a rash that isn't itchy isn't eczema. And with the baby, it often appears on the, on the cheeks, on the outer aspects of the arm, and then on the legs, on the back, and it's itchy. It's really itchy. Dry, inflamed, itchy skin. It's, it's a basic um, diagnosis, but to be honest, it's often missed for various reasons. And then when they grow older, the eczema tends to move to where the skin is thinnest. So it moves to the wrists or the, the corners of the elbows, behind the knees, the ankles, although it can be widespread over the whole whole body. Um, but again, it's a dry, inflamed, mm. itchy skin that they just can't, whether they're a six-week-old baby and they're scratching or you think they're giving you a cuddle and they're rubbing their face. It's the itchiness that defines the eczema. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about when when eczema presents itself? Is is there a, an age where it starts developing, and um, you know the dietary factors, the seasonal factors? Can you tell us all about the ways um, that eczema pre presents itself? Yeah, so it is. You'll get a three month old, and the baby's got red itchy skin on on it on their cheeks, 
and they've been to the doctor a number of times and the GP may say, well, we don't quite know what this is. And so we get a referral into the paediatric department and it usually comes my way. So it's the, it's the itchy, itchy, inflamed skin and the thought that is this fungal, is it yeah. something else? So the, the differential diagnosis or people thinking, well, give this a go, maybe it's infected, but the clue is always the itchy skin. And what I've learned over time is it's the skin barrier dysfunction. It's, you know, people look for all sorts of reasons for eczema, but what we know is that it is a skin barrier dysfunction. So first of all, we look at the skin. Um, many people think, well, if I do this and I don't do that, is it going to go away? Well, with eczema, it's not what you eat, generally speaking. Mm. It's the skin is not working properly. And what happens with that skin, in, in a basic way, it's not holding moisture. So that's why it gets dry. It cannot hold moisture. So one of our mainstays of treating that eczema is to apply moisturizers. So what happens is you're doing physically what everyone else's skin does normally. So you're applying moisturizer mechanically to do what another baby's skin does naturally. And it's in order to retain moisture. And I mean, I think there's a lot of um, shame around eczema. Mm -hmm. um, that is a huge thing with mothers. They won't take their baby to the supermarket because look at the face. And we can address those issues with eczema if we tell them it's a skin barrier dysfunction, it's not holding moisture, therefore, how do we treat? And I liken eczema to a brick wall. Mm. You've got brick mm. and you've got water. And mm. uh, with a child with eczema, their skin or their skin cells is missing the mortar between the bricks. And so it's broken. So the skin's not working properly. And therefore, you know, they start to, because it's dry, it gets itchy. Then the baby, actually, I've seen babies that you wouldn't think would have coordination of their hands managing to tear at their skin because of the itch. So um, if you haven't got the mortar, then we've got to put in place the mortar. And Diana Purvis sort of does it like this. She has her hands together like this, and then she sees these gaps. And so into those gaps um, comes infection, the itch, the red and flame school. So we're trying to get it back to um, a, a skin barrier that's working. Does that mm. make sense, Rose? Yes, it does. So that's the uh, bricks and mortar analogy that I was just about to touch on. And it's okay. really cool that it's really cool that you have uh, just mentioned Dr. Diana Purvis because she will be joining us tomorrow night to talk. Oh, excellent, more. excellent. Very nice. And now, now when it comes to um, the presentation of eczema, can you tell us a little bit about how climate makes a difference uh, to eczema? Is, is it more prevalent um, in terms of colder weather, warmer weather, how does that um, become a factor in, in, a, in a child's journey having eczema? And it does, it does. I've found over the years you'll have a child here in the Eastern Bay in Whakatane and you're, you're struggling to manage that eczema with very proactive moisturising and then steroids and the benefit of bathing and trying to manage the, the infection rate, and they moved to Perth for four years, and the eczema goes away. Yeah. And, and then within two weeks of being back in Whakatane, they've got eczema again. So yes, the weather does make a difference. Um, I think in this neck of the woods anyway, we've got high humidity. Um, and the high humidity, one of the triggers for eczema, it's not the reason for eczema, but one of the triggers is an environmental um, thing that we've all got in our houses, dust mite. And the dust mite uh, gets onto skin and triggers eczema. It is one of the environmental. And so in high humidity, dust mites thrive. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so that trigger is very real for many, many whānau. We've got um, people at the moment, I seem to be getting phone calls, emails um, every day uh, regarding eczema and people not managing eczema well. And I think the cold, damp weather when people are stuck indoors um, does not help at all. Nevertheless, you sometimes find at the end of summer, I get another boost of people uh, uh, saying that they're struggling managing eczema. So yes, the environment does make a big difference. And we try to talk to Fano about the dust mite anyway. We talk about um, vacuuming and cleaning. I also talk about that everyone has dust mite. It doesn't matter who you are. And um, <clears throat> and there is that link. Probably someone else will talk to this a bit more in length, but you can get dust mite covers for sheets and pillows that do help. Help with asthma, eczema, and hay fever. Actually, I call them cousins, those three, asthma, eczema, and hay fever. If you, if you help with one, you're going to help with the other. So, yeah, that's, that's a very real environmental kind of trigger. And winter, yes. It is, and I think it's partly because we're indoors a lot. So we've touched on triggers such as environmental factors, um, high humidity versus low humidity, hot versus cold. Uh, dust mites, a massive, massive issue when it when it comes to um, the skin conditions. Are there any other any other triggers? I, I want to go back to what you mentioned about food um, and diet maybe not necessarily being being a trigger. Can you touch more more on that and provide us with some clarification on how diet affects the eczema journey or doesn't affect it? Yes. Yes, so once a, a baby gets on to about six or seven months and they're starting solids, the 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 what is the the uh, risk is that a parent decides, oh goodness my child's got, my baby's got eczema because they're, they're having dairy now or they're having yogurt or they're eating a bit of cheese or, or peanut butter on toast or whatever. And so um, the fact that eczema is really the skin not functioning rather than the gut or what's taken in, in internally affecting the skin is really quite an important message. Because what happens is people go on these exclusion diets. And as I say to mothers, you know, dairy's got such a lot of goodies in it, the, you know, calcium and the strength for your bones and all the goodness of milk and dairy. It's so important that you don't exclude that based on someone telling you that it could be a trigger for eczema. And the same goes for other, other food sources, nuts and that sort of thing. We now say expose your children earlier to those things because apart from triggering, people thinking they trigger eczema, if you introduce them later, you are more likely to have an allergy response. So yeah, nevertheless, some of these children that do have eczema, a small percentage, do have other allergies as well. So there is, you know, a mother will say to me, my son got out and ate four oranges and his skin just flared. Well, that's a true story. The, lots of oranges just scoff, you know, when you get out onto a mandarin tree and eat three or four and it has triggered his eczema. Well, that is, a, you know, you have to take that into account. But be very careful, um, I say, when you're listening to relatives or well-meaning friends yeah. telling you to exclude really quite important dietary components like dairy or um, gluten for instance mm. uh, that's a common one it really mm. needs to be mm. confirmed by a gp and a pediatrician before you go on exclusion diets yeah yeah. That's a really, really important point. So thank you so much for reiterating that for us, Lydia. I'm just going to move into a question from our viewer. So kia ora, viewer. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, this is our viewer's question, dear Lydia. My eight-month-old has eczema on her eyelids. Not sure what it could be. 
thought it could be formula, but not too sure. She's had it ever since she came from hospital, and that was in February this year. So uh, does formula, does the move to formula play play a big part in eczema symptoms, or are, is it is it just more about moisturize, moisturize, create that barrier? And that's a really difficult question because eyelid eczema is hard to treat, and I feel for that mama. As I said before, I think it's very important that you don't exclude um, food that's important for your baby's nourishment. And I really do think that it would warrant going to the GP and getting a referral to a paediatrician because eyelid eczema is really hard to treat. We, we, we will put a steroid, and Diana will talk about this tomorrow, on the face, but we often exclude the eyelids because it's very sensitive areas. So I would suggest that this little baby needs uh, secondary advice rather than just the GP. Uh, eyelid eczema, I've seen children, you know, of 10, 12 with eyelid eczema and it, it, we struggle to treat well. Um, does, that, does that help? Yeah, absolutely. It is It is nice to be able to reassure our viewer that um, there may be something going on that needs further, that needs further investigation. So thank you for that, Lydia. Um, the next the next topic that I would like to go into is the role of moisturizers. So as we've been discussing from the beginning, um, it's really important to create that barrier, get that skin moisturized to keep it, uh, well, not dry. So I want to um, touch more on the role of moisturizers in managing eczema. And if you can give us a little bit of advice about um, getting moisturizers, gaining, obtaining moisturizers that are free on a prescription. What's out there, Lydia? So we've got a, a real range of moisturizers out there. Uh, we've got lotions, we've got creams, and we've got ointments. And my dialogue used to be a lotion um, is good, not very good. A cream yeah. is really good at moisturizing and an ointment is superb at moisturizing. But we've found of late that any moisturizer applied regularly works, whether it's a lotion, a cream, or an ointment. Um, so moisturizers come in a range of, of um, products. This is Sorbeling. These are all free on a script, which, are, uh, which is what I know a lot about. Um, there's some beautiful moisturizers out there that do work, but if you're gonna pay, say, I don't know, $25 for an Aveeno product, and get 200 grams, yeah. you're not going to use it in the quantity that you need to. So this one here is a Sorbeline, um, that's 950 mils. I just bought this over the counter uh, for, this, for this presentation, but the good thing about Sorbeline is that it comes in a pump bottle. I can't actually work this pump bottle for some reason, but it's a pump <laughs> bottle. And um, what is nice about that is you don't put your hand into the pot because as soon as you put your hand into a pot, we're introducing bacteria. We all have staph and strep on our skin. Um, and when you, even if you clean your hands and you put your hand into the pot, you're introducing bugs into that moisturizer. So this means that you're not putting your hand in the only thing about Sorbeline, I've found one in 10, one in 15 children say it's thin. And I have a feeling it's because of the glycerol in it. And it's the only one that's funded that comes in a pump bottle. Now these are all free on a script for children under 13 years of age. So um, from a point of view of a moisturizer, always order buckets. You know, if, you're, if your baby or child doesn't respond well to this moisturiser, use it on your own, you know, legs after you shave or something, you know. You can make use of moisturiser um, in, the, in the home. Um, so that's a cream, and we've got different creams here. Aqueous cream. Now, this one went out of favour 
about 10 years ago because it had a product in it that was sodium laurel sulfate, and that's a salt. So that used to actually dry the skin um, in the end, but these days it's SLS free. So you can use this as a moisturiser, as a soap sub substitute, you can use any of these as soap substitutes, but Agnes Cream now we use again. Use them liberally. Now, what's this um, fatty emulsion cream? Again, a, a lovely product. The thing about moisturizers is using them. You know, non ionic cream is really this one without the glycerol. So, if this one stings, give this one a go. Um, yeah. Emulsifying ointment is the next one. Emulsifying ointment is really, really. Um, uh, tacky, I'll just take a, you know, it's tacky. So I mm. love emulsifying ointment for, for a face of a baby. It really is okay. hard, hard to get out. So oh. I suggest, Rose, that babies with eczema on the face use this because it sticks more. And the, you know, babies that wipe it off or scratch their yeah. face, this is a goodie for that. So that's the emulsifying ointment as opposed to the creams. Got it. Yeah. Ointment versus cream. Okay. Yes. So, so with regards to, you've shown us a few amazing products that can be prescribed and uh, can be obtained uh, through no cost for uh, children under 13. That was correct, wasn't it? It was for children under yes. 13? Yes. So yep. all of the all of the active ingredients, so glycerin, um, the non-ionic um, SLS free products, they've obviously got all different active ingredients in them. When yes. when a when a diagnosis is made, uh, are you able to touch on what factors come into play, which then match up to what ointment is prescribed? Is there is there a is there a general rule? It's what works for that child. So it is a wee bit of trial and error. You know, if you if your baby screams when you apply a moisturizer, one moisturizer and not another, then 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 take note of that because you want to be able to apply it up to five times a day for a baby. You know, every time you change a nappy, moisturize because again you're doing mechanically for the skin what it can't do for itself to hold moisture. So you need something that works basically and because they're free on a script, you should be able to go back to the GP and say, look, this one doesn't work. Can I trial another one? Or go with, um, you know, go with a, a few noted down. Can I have a wee bit of this and a wee bit of that? You can get them into 50 gram tubes and they're quite good for the nappy bag. So um, yeah. it is really trial and error. Uh, and, and um, a GP shouldn't mind about writing a script for multiple moisturising creams. And you might use a, a mix. So you might use emulsifying ointment for the face and cheeks and under the chin where, where babies dribble and, and exposed to a lot of food and, and stuff. And you might use sorbeline for the rest of the skin. You know, and, or you might have an older child that's getting better at applying it themselves and the sorbeline is great because they can just pump it and put it on. Yes. Absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for that. Uh, on, my, on my personal journey as a mother, we were prescribed all different products and I wondered, what is all of this and how do you know it's going to work so it makes a lot of sense that it is all trial and error and i kind of wish that my common sense had prevailed thinking that that's exactly what was happening <laughs> yes I, and, and, then, I'm, and I, I think what can happen though is that they, that the moisturizer doesn't isn't a fit and then the mother feels yeah. a bit guilty. And so then she doesn't go back and ask for another one. She feels she's failed. And I think it's important that mothers never think
think they fail with ethnic here because it's a common sense. I'll go into many whare and talk to whānau and they, they'll cry because they think they've failed um, when there needs to be some monitoring of how they're doing. Yes. Yeah. And that's an excellent point to make in the community here in Taranaki. I do have a lot of parents. They, they actually get quite emotional about how much they feel like their children suffer at the hands yes. of the eczema. So it's really important to know that there is no cure for eczema, but it can be managed and just how many options there are for support and that there will never, pretty much never be a time where a um, healthcare professional throws their hands in the air and says, I don't know. So that's really reassuring for our whanau out there to know there will always be support and options and avenues to take. So everybody don't give up, don't ever feel like a failure. Such such a good point. Thank you for bringing that up, Lydia. Mm. So when, when applying moisturisers, um, I kind of, sometimes with a whānau, you know, you'll, you'll talk through all the paperwork and I've got lots of it and you'll say, do this and here's that action plan and do that. But there's times where I just say, go into the whare, I say, run the bath. And when you run the bath, then I, I get the steroids and put them on in a demonstrable way. And then with moisturisers, we just um, cream up that baby or child so they're white like a snow, snow, snow girl or boy. They're actually literally using moisturiser um, with gay abandon, is that the right word? Or, you know, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, 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 honestly, and some funny where, the, where the, they've got beautiful furnishings and plush carpet, it's a wee bit of an issue because you've got a, a, a two-year-old running round with, covered with white moisturiser, but actually it's so effective to use yeah. it in bucket loads. And, you know, with a, a four-year-old with, um, with uh, active eczema will go through a pot of moisturiser in a fortnight. You should be going through heaps. Yeah. And so, you know, I often, you know, I'll take nine, I, on a couple, I will um, say to the funnel, don't put your hands in the pot, get a clean spoon um, and a bowl and dispense it, you know, dispense it like in great quantities. It doesn't matter if you waste a bit, it's free on a script. <laughs> and put it in the bowl. <laughs> and then apply liberally. And I'm, do you mind if I just put some on my own skin to, you know, just... Let's go, just, absolutely. Yeah, and lots, you know, and just like it's white. Yeah. And, and especially after a bath, you know, after mm. a bath, it will... Within five minutes, that child, it will have soaked in. You'd be surprised how the skin just sucks it up. And that's, that's one of the ways we, we don't see people using moisturisers liberal, liberally enough. Liberally. <laughs> liberally enough. And, and that's why we'll say go through pots of the stuff. You know, I'm rather a big person, so obviously one, you know, half an arm takes quite a bit. But, you know, even with children. Um, and, and one of the other things is have repeats on the script because you don't want to have to go back to the GP just to get moisturisers. Yeah. You know, you should have, say, a, a one kilo every fortnight mm -hmm. and three months script. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Love it. So that's so that's a really liberal amount of of the moisturizer. So everybody take note. That's about how much we need to put on our little one's skin to keep it nice and maintained. And just to confirm, Lydia, our whānau don't have to rub and rub and rub until it's completely absorbed. No. The skin will do that all on its own. Yes. It will soak it up all on its own, particularly after a bath. You know, and in children's ward here in Whakatane, if, if they come into hospital for eczema treatment, one of the things we do is put them in the bath twice within the 24-hour period because after a bath, the skin is so receptive to what you put on it and it will just soak it in. Yeah. 
Lovely. I'm just going to move across. We've got a question from another viewer. So thank you so much for your question. We've got two here, but we'll just start with the question that's come from Facebook. It reads, my eight month old has eczema, but she doesn't scratch the dry inflamed bits on her body, but she scratches her chest where there's no dryness or inflammation. Can eczema not present as dry and inflamed? Sorry, you're just um, muted somehow, but eczema, the, the, the key thing with eczema is the itch. Have we finished? No, we haven't it's, finished. Oh, good. So it is, it is the itch. And I would suggest that if it's not, not itchy, then there might be something else going on there. My eight-month-old has eczema, and so where did that diagnosis come from? And, and if it's not itchy, what else is it? I know yeah. some skin conditions can trigger eczema. So, for instance, you might have a child with chicken pox and they've got over the chicken pox, but they're left with eczema. Or other skin mm -hmm. conditions that come into children's ward and I'll visit in a, a six weeks post-discharge and the initiating skin condition has been um, fixed, but the eczema carries on. So... Um, that's an interesting question, and I'm sorry, I can't, I don't know why she wouldn't scratch the eczema mm -hmm. rather than on her chest where there is no eczema. I would suggest that sometimes eczema presents as an itch rather than a dry yeah. flame skin. So I would treat that skin as if it did have eczema as well as the rest of the body. Lovely. Mm -hmm. And we've got a question here from YouTube. Can you hear me okay now? I'm sorry I cut out before. Is this okay? This is okay. I'm managing. Yeah. Excellent. You're doing excellent, Lydia. Thank you. Oh, we'll, go to our, we'll go to our uh, YouTube question, which reads, my 12-week-old has eczema, but only on the face and the arms. I've noticed yeah. that heat makes it worse. Any reason why yes. this could be? Yes, and that, that mama is absolutely correct. Heat is an enemy of eczema. Your, your baby or child or toddler will be throwing off clothes. They're, they're hot. They run hot. It's because of this inflammation in the skin. So, yes, you're right. Uh, heat is, they like a cool environment, a cool bedroom, you know, not too many bed clothes. Yeah. Heat is, is an enemy of eczema for sure. Yeah. Is it the, um, is so it the heat itself or the presentation of perspiration? No, it's the heat. It's mm. the heat, not, not so much the perspiration. It's because they already feel hot with eczema. Mm. They already are running hot. Mm. So um, often a child with eczema, you just say to a mama, you know, they run hot and they'll just say, oh, yeah, well, I can't keep a coat on her. You know, she'll strip off her leggings and just, you know, be running around in the shorts on a cold day. But that is exactly right. They feel hot. So keep them cool. Yeah. Um, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then a follow-up a follow up question um, for this viewer is, what would you suggest for a 2.8-year-old with very sensitive skin for bathing and washing their hair. So is, is there something that's a, a little little more hypoallergenic uh, that can be used for sensitive skin in terms of washing hair, washing the body? So we, we, we just, anyone with eczema, we just don't use shampoos or soaps at all. You can use a very liquid moisturiser, rub through the hair and rinse off, just like the rest of the body. If she's got sensitive skin, I would shy away from all soap um, products, you know, even the ones that are considered sensitive. I would try and get away with just using a moisturiser as a soap substitute. Really, soaps are, are created to strip dirt and oil off the skin. And so that's what they do. They're just you know, the enemy, really, of eczema sufferers. Does that make and sense? It's, it certainly does. It really does. 
So thank you. And to our, our YouTube viewer, we hope that answers your question. And just, so we're we're at the we're on the final part of our uh, our interview for today, Lydia. And so we've just had a couple of uh, follow up questions regarding diet. Um, now we did discuss the factors of diet in in an eczema journey, but um, I just wanted to get you to reiterate: um, Are there foods that can trigger eczema? But also, can a mother's diet act as a trigger for an exclusively breastfed baby? An exclusively breastfed baby needs to carry on being exclusively breastfed. There are times when a child is what we might call atopic. In other words, they've got something else going on there, of which eczema may be one of them. Um, so if that child or if that baby who's exclusively breastfed has other issues like looks like they're in pain or they've got mucus in stools or um, there's other indicators of something else going al alongside and they've also got sensitive skin, then you may, under the direction of a paediatrician I would say, um, go to an exclusion diet. But that's not about the eczema, that's about what else is happening. And that, you know, um, and then you need a dietitian and a paediatrician to really just manage that. And then the mother should, in that case, go on an exclusion diet. Maybe it's dairy that's triggered the other issues as well as the eczema. But if it's only eczema, no. There's no rationale for going on an exclusion diet for the mother because it's the skin barrier dysfunction. The skin is not working well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I just want to touch on the purpose um, of natural products uh, as, as an alleviation for eczema. So you've given us a really good rundown of the sorbeline, the aqueous, um, I'm going to assume you've got a, a, a set of macro goal there somewhere or something. Is that what it's called? Yes, so this is a set of macro goal. It looks at, at pink. It can be pink. It, they, it depends on the supplier. This is a topoderm um, supplier, but the one you would get on a script looks pink. Cool. So it's the yeah. same product, just a different supplier. Um, so what was the question? Um, yes. So, you know, if you find other products that work, you know, by all means, use them. By all means. I never, um, I would never say if, if a mama's using, say, a kawakawa cream that Nan has given you, if it works, use it by all means. Right. I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, if it works, use it. Um, I know a lot about these because they're free. They're free. And, you know, the burden of eczema goes on and on and on. What I say is we treat eczema, we don't cure it. So you're in for the long haul. So you've got to put in place something that's sustainable. Um, and if Nan is happy to keep providing the kawakawa in a, in a moisturising cream, that's amazing. And, you know, these things, these... these um, these products out there that do work well. The yeah, Avino products are beautiful, some of them, but they're expensive. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So the, um, yes, I never, I'm sorry, Lydia, I never got around to asking the question, silly Rose. So um, the question was, so you've showed us the products that you have in front of us as alleviation yes. for eczema. Uh, but this girl wants to know about um, natural products that you'd recommend so oils you've touched on kawakawa balm and um, maybe yeah. oils such as because i've heard over my years as a parent i'm just speaking as a parent a uh, coconut oil is is really effective so can you speak to the use of of oils in the eczema journey or, or would they do more harm uh, as an instead of an alleviation i think oils are, you know we talk about oils um treating cradle cake coconut oil and again, um, give it a go. The only, the only um, 
is it caviar, is that the word? Um, and using food products on the skin because of, you know, avocado cream, a um, whole lot of food products are now in, in creams and in products. For some children that can trigger react, a reaction if, that, if, if, if the skin's exposed to a food product before they eat it. Mm. Does that make mm. sense? So if you use it's avocado done. or the cream for a child that tends to be um, have eczema, asthma, and maybe a few allergies, then you're more likely to get an allergic reaction to say avocado at 18 months if you introduce it then. So we're, we're cautious about putting um, food products on the skin before they're eating it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, another question from YouTube. We've got lots of questions coming through. Thank you so much, everyone, for your pathway, for your questions. Uh, my boy itches a lot when he is anxious or has some sort of emotion. Is this a part of eczema? Yes, so uh, emotional um, trauma does trigger a child that may have a propensity to eczema. Mm -hmm. Certainly a child will go through a trauma and the eczema will, will reoccur or raise its ugly head. The other thing is that we find that a child that you might have the eczema really well controlled, but they've got into the scratch cycle. And um, believe you me, children can scratch while they're sound asleep. And so, you know, you might, there might be something happened during the day and they're anxious and and in their sleep they're scratching. Um, so yes, um, trauma does does unfortunately is one of those triggers for eczema. That that already probably exists. The eczema probably already exists. It's just one of those things. Teasing at school because the skin, you know, then they're likely to get anxious and then they like to just scratch more. For sure. Yeah, lovely. Um, now we've just had a couple, another another couple of questions come through on our page, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. So what we're going to do, if you far know, is if we haven't addressed your question, we will reply to you in the comments section just to give you the answers that you need. So fear not, we can't deal with your questions now due to running out of time, but we will answer your questions. Lydia, I want to thank you so much for coming along to this interview to give us a really wonderful overview of eczema, diagnosis, the um, brick and mortar analogy, the wonderful products that are available on a prescription and um, a little bit about, you know, what you do in the community to support these families. Thank you for listening, everyone. I mean, you know, eczema is one of those things that you, once you get talking, you can talk forever about eczema because there's so much to learn. So thank you for listening. No worries. And um, for everybody out there, I just want to remind you that we have got part two in our series for Skin Week, and that is on steroids and eczema. That'll be at 7 p.m. tomorrow, the 6th of September. And that's with our Dr. Diana Purvis. So please stay tuned for that if you would like to know more about steroids and eczema. We are going to sign off for now, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Those whose questions we weren't able to answer in the interview, we will get back to you in writing. Otherwise, kia pai te ra, kia koutou katoa. Have a wonderful day and we'll all see you soon. Ka kite anō. Ka kite.